a sort of bullish, uh, heavy set. And if you look at the uh, photo on the ID card, that matches pretty exactly with what she described. James Keith Powell. So yeah, it matches up with the name Keith. So we've matched a name and a face to the ghost, which is exactly what we were trying to do tonight. Noelle seems to have matched a name and a face to the entity haunting the quasi home. Jim and his team believe the tangible evidence they have uncovered will bring them one step closer to proving the existence of ghosts. So how do you guys feel about what we found here tonight? I feel good. The places that they hope to find further proof that ghosts not only exist, but that they were once living, breathing people. <coughs> Fresh from their success in a suburban home near Raleigh, North Carolina, Jim Hall and his ghost hunting team are continuing their quest to find proof of the existence of ghosts and connect them to people who once lived. Gold fever hit a small community near Salisbury, North Carolina in the early 1800s, and the Gold Hill Mine quickly became one of the richest sites in North America. Today, the mine is a fascinating historic site visited year-round by tourists. My grandpa made uh, like a dollar and a half a week here, and he started out carrying water. The ghost hunting team has heard legends and stories of mysterious lights at the bottom of the mine. They begin their investigation with local historian Vivian Hopkins, who fills them in on one such legend. Aaron Klein was a young uh, Jewish boy and came into a mining camp full of um, rough and rowdy miners. Klein fell in love with a local woman named Elizabeth Morrow. But another miner, Big Stan Coupola, was also interested in her. When Klein mysteriously disappeared, many believed that Coupola had killed him. This rumor gained strength when strange, unexplained lights, thought to be the ghost of Aaron Klein, materialized in the Gold Hill Mine only a week after his disappearance. One fellow in particular, of course, Stan Coupola. It really hovered around him, spooking him a lot. On one morning, when the miners would pull the gurney up, um, Stan's body was crushed on the gurney. So they, at, at that point, they uh, assumed that maybe the lights, Aaron's ghost, had come back and shoved him to his death. Jim Hall has heard many ghost stories like the one about Aaron Klein. In fact, it was his own real-life experience of a haunting that shaped his interest in the paranormal. One of the reasons I got into ghost hunting is when I was a small child, our family experienced a, uh, a poltergeist type haunting. We experienced a lot of phenomena in our house, uh, objects that flew across the room. Bible, he started praying and reciting the 23rd Psalm, and he says that winds were just blowing all over the place, things were flying off the walls, uh, and after that we experienced no more phenomena. Hmm. Tonight, Jim and his team will be concentrating on the technical aspects of ghost hunting by taking readings of temperature, electromagnetic fields, and changes in positive and negative ions in the air. It is mostly outdoors, and it's very, very cold, so we're going to be working in kind of some hard conditions. While collecting data outside, it is impossible to control the environment. Sensitive equipment and measurements can be distorted by natural conditions like rain, wind, and temperature extremes. As Jim and Dave continue checking the mine shaft, Mark and Noel investigate the Powder House, another location at Gold Hill Mine where there have been unexplained events. There are strange lights appear in photos. Um, a couple people in particular have uh, experienced strange feelings on visiting there. Mark and Noel collect environmental information. Noel checks for changes in temperature, while Mark uses an alternating current field meter to find any irregularities in the surrounding electromagnetic fields. According to experts, sudden changes in temperature or electromagnetic fields are good indications of the presence of a ghost. That was a huge spot just a second ago. Really? Right here. Mark's scanner registers an unexplained spike. The team might have 
what they're looking for. Yeah, Tangible yeah. evidence of a ghost. At the historic Gold Hill Mine near Salisbury, North Carolina, Jim Hall and his ghost hunting team search for evidence of ghosts. They are investigating two legendary murders and mysterious lights that have been seen in one of the mine shafts. Inside the powder house, Mark and Noel have discovered an odd reading from their equipment. Uh, equipment. We'll do the equipment again, see? That's there. An electromagnetic spike under normal conditions could suggest paranormal activity. Yeah, However, but... the minerals in the nearby mine most likely means the unusual reading was caused by nature, not by a ghost. I'm kind of wary um, as to whether or not we're going to find anything because the activity that's been reported out here is very sporadic and there haven't been any apparition sites in a number of years. With no significant evidence of paranormal activity, Jim decides to wrap up for the evening. Although the ghost hunting team is unable to identify the exact source of the mysterious lights, or a specific identity of a ghost at the mine, they aren't discouraged. People have a tendency to attach meaning to things that don't really have any meaning. Maybe their house is settling and they hear the creaking and the groaning and they think that it's a ghost. Maybe 99% of the cases that we've investigated turn out to be nothing more than that, but there's that 1%, that 1% that defy explanation, and those are the ones that keep us coming back night after night after night. Jim Hall and his ghost hunting team are on a quest to prove the existence of ghosts. Their search continues at another famous North Carolina location. Today, the Stagville Plantation is a historic landmark open to the public. But in the 1800s, nearly 1,000 slaves worked the more than 30,000 acres. Anytime you have a place with this kind of history, and especially the kind yeah, of brutal right. history that uh, the slavery has, uh, there's the opportunity, the conditions are there uh, for haunting type phenomena because you have um, extreme emotional states over a long period of time. Um, a lot of... Uh, a lot of harsh conditions that people lived under, um, a lot of deaths that probably happened through violence. Uh, as unfortunate as that may be, uh, these are things that lend, them, lend themselves to, uh, to haunting type phenomena. Both visitors and employees have seen the apparition of a young African-American girl. Jim Hall's team will try to identify this ghost and for the first time, recreate what she looks like. Jennifer Farley, historical interpreter, believes that a ghost is responsible for the many unusual experiences she's had at the plantation. There's um, old skeleton keys in the door in the doors um, of the house, and we keep those keys in the locks at all times. They work like a deadbolt for us. Um, when we leave the house, we set a burglar alarm. And there have been a few instances when we come in the morning to open up the house, the skeleton key has been removed from the interior lock and is laying in the middle of the floor, somewhere where it's been placed, obviously. It couldn't have just fallen out of the door, but the fire, the burglar alarm hasn't gone off. You hear um, voices in here a lot. Sometimes they're women talking, sometimes they're men talking. It's muffled. You can't tell what they're saying. It's as though you're hearing it through a wall. In the 
1800s, the main house was the center of daily life on the plantation. Lately, it has been the location of many paranormal activities and a good place for Jim to attempt to get video evidence of a ghost. A video camera is pointed towards a monitor and the video signal is fed through the monitor back to the camera. This creates what is called Jim and Dave leave their recording equipment in the loft. They later return to check on their experiment. As they go through the tape, they make a shocking discovery. They may have evidence of the ghost they are searching for. I don't know. It's weird. hunting team has come to the historic Stagville plantation in search of proof for the existence of ghosts. The apparition of a young African-American girl has been seen numerous times here, and the team hopes they will be able to see her for themselves tonight. Jim Hall has discovered what could be evidence of paranormal activity in the loft of the main house, where someone or something has tampered with their video equipment. When we set up the tape, Look at the screen. You see, we were tied in on the monitor. All right, we were filming the monitor, and we were tied on the monitor. Okay, okay. Jim and Dave discovered that the television mysteriously turned off after 15 minutes without any member of the team being present in the room. Come back to okay. Ten minutes later, their equipment again behaves oddly. For no explainable reason, the camera Have another join. out completely. Normally, it is impossible for a camera to do this unless the zoom is manually adjusted. Could a ghost have manipulated the video camera? The camera's completely zoomed out. Do you think that it, somehow that the, like the, auto, uh, the autofocus was going in and Shit. out of focus? Oh, wow. that it would... Autofocus and the zoom are independent. Autofocus, sure. Zoom, no, it's not going to zoom out by itself. I don't know, it's just one more thing to add to the pile of weird stuff that happens yeah. here. Yeah. The fact that the video equipment has been played with leads Jim to conclude an entity with childlike curiosity may have caused the abnormalities. He decides to bring Noel and Waverly to the loft. Noel might be able to get enough psychic impressions of the ghost they are searching for so that Waverly can create a sketch. The female entity, the short um, African-American girl that comes in is with an S, um, Sari, Sari, so, and it's not Sarah. Her eyes are, her, her cheekbones, and uh, her cheekbones are prominent, her eyes set in a little, just, just a little hollowed through here. That could be a bell. There is a sound about eight minutes in, and there was nobody around. So there was nobody around to make that sound. This place definitely is not normal. No, I think you can definitely say that. Waverly and Noel will continue to work on the sketch. By the end of the week, they hope to recreate the face of the little girl who seems to be haunting the Stagville plantation. They will use the sketch to help search historical records in order to prove that this young girl, now a ghost, was once a slave working on the vast plantation. Anticipation builds for the ghost hunting team as they head to their next location, a historic and unusual ghost haunting in Wilmington, North Carolina. The USS North Carolina served in every major battle in the Pacific during the Second World War. The ship was decommissioned in June 1947 as one of the most decorated in the Pacific Fleet. Once again, the team will try to find indisputable evidence for the existence of ghosts. A photograph, a voice caught on tape, anything that might prove that the sailors who died aboard the vessel haven't finished fighting their war. Mia Bernard has researched the USS North Carolina for years. She will be a valuable resource for the ghost hunters. Pretty much everyone in the area will tell you that there 
there are hauntings on the ship and things that they cannot explain. Even tourists that have come through on their own have mentioned their own experiences. Quite frequently, um, the night watchman uh, sees these apparitions. He hears voices on the ship when he's there alone at night. Uh, and so we're hoping while we're there to both capture some type of evidence, but also be able to tie that to the people that we know served on the ship and that died uh, in service and maybe attach a face or a name to whoever or whatever is, uh, is haunting that ship. Jim has invited another paranormal research team to help collect evidence aboard the massive battleship. He escorts this group, led by psychic Ann Poole, to an area well known for paranormal activity. Head home, head to bed, wake up in the morning, head to school. Another day of high school. A rocket. Back up. Hey, boys. Hey, boss. Hey. Five in the morning. Let's head to school, I guess. May as well, right? Head to fucking school. 
Hey boss. See boss. See ya. I'm walking at Head to school yo. Move. Walk it. Push pie. Have a joint for a day. It kind of gives us an idea of where items were placed in the room. And then before we leave, go back and kind of go through the rooms again and document again where things are because some ghosts do tend to move things. And we might catch something that moves that maybe nobody really noticed at the time. Ann Poole and her team in sick bay make an urgent call. Another area of the 
ship known for paranormal activity is the whole have another board the team's audio technologist mark Rook hmm. sets up equipment in an attempt to record evidence this is a digital audio recorder and what we try to do with this is actually capture something called electronic voice phenomena or EVP um, which are uh, ghostly voices that appear on recorded media We've caught people uh, talking. We've actually caught things like baby crying, babies crying. So it's, it's pretty interesting. The ghost hunting crew has found that EVPs are only discovered when the tapes are reviewed and replayed at a high volume, creating yet another mystery. Why are people unable to hear them without the help of recording devices? After a long night of ghost hunting, the team meets up in the captain's quarters to wrap up their investigation. Anne Poole and her team reveal that they may have physical evidence of a ghost haunting the ship. Let's wrap this up. What do we got? Well, we didn't have an apparition, but in the uh, galley area, the general area, there was a chain that had rubbed off an area, and the chain was moving by itself. It had a pretty good pace to it. It was going back and forth. And, and you did document it. We did document it. We have that on film. Okay. Well, one of the things that we were trying to do tonight, as you know, is, is take the research one step further and see if we can put a name with the activity that's been happening out here. I think that at least there might be possible that it might be multiple entities out here. Yeah. But at least one of them I think we could possibly identify as Thurman Thompson. He died March 7th, 1942. Hmm. Although Melissa Southern's photographs didn't reveal any proof of ghostly activity, the team still has some interesting evidence to consider. Some of the highlights for me, uh, number one was being able to tie so much of the activity that's been reported, not just tonight, um, but over the years. Um, to one particular name, and it seems that Thurman Thomas uh, keeps, his story keeps coming up in the various yeah, areas of the ship where the activity has been reported, so that's a really strong indication that if there is an entity on the ship, uh, that he, it's probably him. Jim Hall's ghost hunting team has been successful finding some physical evidence of the supernatural, a chain swinging on its own. They have also identified the ghost of Thurman Thompson, discovered that the spirit of a dead burn victim matches with the story of sailor Earl Julian Winthrop, who died aboard the battleship USS North Carolina. The team has one more surprise in store. As audio-visual specialists Mark and Carrie review the material, they notice an anomaly in the sound. Could the ghosts have left a message for the team? North Carolina team has finished their investigation aboard the USS North Carolina, a decommissioned ship from World War II. Now a popular tourist destination, the battleship has had many reports of hauntings. Jim Hall and his team have been successful in their search and for the first time identified two of the entities roaming the vessel, Earl Julian Winthrop and Thurman Thompson, who both died aboard the ship. Members of the team meet to compare notes, and they discover a piece of evidence that might suggest the team might have been watched by a ghost. All right, I found some uh, interesting uh, sounds, maybe an EVP, uh, last night's uh, brig. Uh, we were talking about actually going into the brig where they hold prisoners. <laughs> It's a whisper over it, but it, and you know the song because you can tell that it wasn't one of them, right? It like yeah, that was. Head home, head to bed, wake up in the morning, another day of school, yo. <coughs> <coughs> I'm 
unlock it. Now take a picture, go right ahead. There you go. Move. Shit, move the fuck out of my way. Hey boss. Hey boss. Hi. Five in the morning. See ya boss. See ya boss. See ya. I'm walking. Head to school yo. May as well. <laughs> Walk it. Push pie. Have a job for a day. Have another joint. Lots of weird stuff happens huh. around this area. We have gotten very special permission from the uh, Navajo Reservation to investigate Skinwalker Canyon. They never go there. It's like off limits. Total off limits. They will not enter the canyon. Yeah. So I think that's why they invited Fuck them. Fuck Skinwalkers. So here on the reservation, they can die. You just shoot canyon. them. They're dead. They're weak. They're not strong. So why are people so afraid of them? You shoot them. Then they're fucking dead. Simple enough. Easy. Everything can die. Even me. I believe God can die. I believe the devil can die. Somehow. I believe the skinwalkers can die. Bigfoot can die. Everything can die in the way. 
There is always a way to kill things. I believe there is a way to kill God and the devil. And Bigfoot, of course. Everything can die. Like shit. Why are people so afraid of them? To shoot them. Done. They're dead. Dumb fucks. There's a whole different culture here. And there's a whole different beliefs. Shit there man. Creatures here called skinwalkers. They strongly believe that these Fuck the skinwalkers. They're nothing fun. The reservation we're at right now. They do. Okay, it's a very, very short. They're pushy. They, for the most part, fear the skinwalker. Huh. <laughs> Can walk my ass. They can die. Everything can die. Like I said, God can die. I believe there's a way to kill God. But according to accounts, there was a Navajo man who was known on the reservation for conjuring skinwalker entities through witchcraft. His wife said this created a darkness inside of him that kept growing until one day she put an end to it. By cutting off his head. Oh. So your advice to me, to us, is to find Navajo people and ask them about the skinwalkers, the Navajo witches, and they will tell us more in detail about them. Some of them will. Why, why wouldn't others? Would they? If they talk about the skinwalker to you, Something could happen to them. Something could happen. Like what? They could get sick. They could die or go blind. They could die. Yeah. So something very serious could could happen to us. Not to you. Not to me. Why? You don't believe in the skinwalker. I do, though. No, you don't. You I do. think you do. But if you really believed in the skinwalker, you wouldn't be going to skinwalker camp. Tom's words chill me to the very bone. In all my years of exploring the paranormal, huh. this is something I know very little about. I feel uncertain for the first time in years about what lies ahead and how wise it is to look for it. Members of the tribe have come out to welcome us and offer us safe passage into the canyon. I can only hope that we won't need it. What's up, guys? How you doing? What is it, Yate? Yate, hello. Take care of yourselves and your endeavors and what you're here to look for, the skinwalkers. Blessings to you and your crew as well. This means a lot to us. We thank you, and we are ready to do this investigation while the goodness of all your hearts will protect us. Thank you. Despite this blessing, it is hard to feel at ease knowing we are heading deeper into the skinwalkers' territory. These roads are very well known for you drive at night, you see a coyote, then all of a sudden you're doing 60 miles per hour, and the coyote is running with you. You can see it out the side of your window. The coyote then turns into a man, and the man has glowing yellow eyes. Run over the bit. Simple enough. Or get out and shoot it. When I would keep, you know, or get out and shoot it, can As we approach Skinwalker Canyon for the first time, we see a huge dirt barrier and barbed wire fence blocking the entrance. My nerves begin to tense up. We meet a man named Randy. If people go hunt the beast, then it'll be no more. It'll be no more threat. It'll be got a stink. The skin, you know, if people hunt. That I can walk it and make them gone. Oh, they're gone. Simple enough. Navajo people doesn't have to worry about skin walkies anymore. They're extinct. There are people killing them. And I get nauseated. There's two parts to it. There's the 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 actual person that's doing the singing. 
and the conjuring right here. This is what you see in the dark. The conjuring. Oh shit. The Navajo witch creates the skinwalker entity through a sacrificial ritual where it has control of what acts of terror it does on the living. But where in Skinwalker Canyon are these rituals done? Why this particular canyon? Why do you think the skinwalkers are here? Is this their home? There's a cave back there. You believe that the cave in Skinwalker Canyon is where these Navajo witches will will do the conjuring. They will. What we call bad medicine. Well, we just got here. Uh, we're at the entrance of Ojo Amarillo Canyon, Skinwalker Canyon. Uh, what's the gun for? There may be a Skinwalker out there. Uh, during the day, it's very highly unlikely, but.